स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया गुड मॉर्निंग सो वी विल कंटिन्यू डिस्कसिंग न्यू हॉलीवुड पीरियड एंड वी हैव बीन टॉकिंग अबाउट न्यू हॉलीवुड पीरियड फॉर क्वाइट अ वाइल्ड इजी राइडर डेनिस हॉपर एंड सेवरल अदर पीपल ऑफ दैट इरा वी ऑल्सो टॉक अबाउट द बी बी एस शनाइडर बॉब रॉफेलसन एंड स्टीव ब्लॉमर एंड वॉट रोल डिड दे प्ले in bringing about a cinematic revolution we also talked about certain socio political cultural happenings of that period and what role did uh, those factors play on shaping the cinema of that particular period we were talking about bonnie and clyde and a hard days night i so i'm just helping you to revise what we have been doing all this while today's key concept would be first wave of Uh, cinema that is hollywood director so we have already talked about Holly, the first wave today we will discuss two major filmmakers of the first wave hal ashby and william friedkin and then we will move on to the second wave of directors so first wave included francis ford coppola as well uh, warren beatty arthur penn we have done bonnie and clyde we have at least understood what it it was all about and key texts would be shampoo directed by hal ashby the french connection and the exorcist both directed by uh, bill fritkin rosemary's baby and china town by roman polanski good socio cultural concept that we'll be looking at um, the music scenario so rolling stones hell's angels and charles manson who was a serial killer a dreaded serial killer and we know what his place is if you don't know much about charles manson or about any of these people please look them up okay so uh, we just watched a clipping of martin scorsese's first major success of course first movie was who is that knocking at my door but mean street brought him into limelight so the scene that you just watched how does that fit into that entire scene of new hollywood period exactly that's very good handheld lightweight camera the sound hmm? the car in the background and the sound of the traffic city so real life sound. yeah city sound. so as harvey keitel moves towards the window uh, and uh, it's a very stream of consciousness kind of dialogue you know a very internal kind of monologue he's thinking to himself thinking uh, something is happening in his mind some there is some kind of a conflict some kind of anxieties which he shares with us so very stream of consciousness so very interior so that's what scorsese meant by making personal films very psychological and psychologically driven personal films okay so you can hear the street sound yeah is set in new york what else it's not a very polished look yeah the titles are not very polished but they give an impression of give me the word and not exactly documentary is like exactly home video look and it's deliberately done so the home video look is deliberately given so that you give the impression that it's a very personal picture and then have a kid till going through the motions what are what is he doing yeah uh, it's somebody's baptism so martin scorsese again taking you back to his um, uh, 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 very italian american kind of background that see this is the way i grew up so have a have a kid till is nothing but his own persona okay have we have we channels martin scorsese at several levels yeah he is in fact if you look at him he is a scorsese whereas bob de niro who plays johnny boy 
he is a complete opposite of uh, Harvey Ketel. Have you watched the movie? You know the movie? We did screen it the other day. So, uh, <coughs> Bob De Niro is something that he would like to be. Okay, he is aggressive, he is impulsive, he can uh, throw himself into uh, in a fight, whereas uh, Scorsese always ran away from fights. Why? Why was that? He was very short to begin with. He was also a sickly child. He grew up in a very strong Catholic Italian American background household and where the emphasis was always on following certain code of conduct and uh, the neighborhood was vastly criminal. So, he had grown up among guns and knives people, but inside people were extremely religious. So, his, there were no criminals in his family. But he had grown up, his friends were all from that kind of background. His uh, parents on the other hand were deeply religious and they wanted him to become a man of the cloth. But somehow because he was an asthmatic child, most of the time he was uh, restricted at home. He was not allowed to play too much. Uh, he was always seen with a pump, you know, an inhaler and all. So, he grew like most lonely kids he developed a fascination for the movies and then he started watching them. But he did not come from a very educated background. There, were, there was no such cultural scene at home uh, that would introduce him to the best of world cinema. He would just go to the neighborhood uh, theatre. He attended NYU. So, that generation, that second generation of filmmakers were film literates. That is what you have to understand and that showed in their films. Now, tell me about this soundtrack. I am extremely interested in the soundtrack of that uh, period, especially in Mart Martin Scorsese, Be My Baby by Ronettes. Okay? Now, what kind of soundtrack is that? What? Give me the word for it. Is it an OST, original soundtrack for this movie? Then what is it? It is a source music. Hmm? So, this is one word, that one expression that you have to remember. When you watch a movie, a musical like My Fair Lady, are you aware of that? My Fair Lady? No? Please do watch it. It is classic Hollywood. Classic Hollywood coming to an end. Okay, it is that period where people sing songs in their own voices and songs are especially composed for that film. The Sound of Music, are you at least aware of the movie? Even if you have not watched the movie, The Sound of Music. Now, people would sing songs. Songs would be composed especially for the film. Okay. The last movie that followed this pattern, you know, a great Hollywood musical which bombed badly and after that it was the end of Hollywood musicals for a very long time was Dr. Doolittle starring Rex Harrison. The other day, I got a mail from one of our students that she is acting in a uh, play, Blythe Spirit by Noel Coward and suddenly I was transported to those days. Blythe Spirit is a very, very interesting, very funny play by Noel Coward starring Rex Harrison, a very young Rex Harrison, a great British actor who starred in Cleopatra as Caesar. He also starred in My Fair Lady, Professor Higgins. He also starred in uh, Dr. Doolittle, where he would sing songs. Okay, so, that is uh, an original soundtrack for a movie. But people like Scorsese, etcetera, they sourced music. Now, there are several in instances of sourced music in Scorsese, particularly in Mean Streets. Taxi Driver has a background score by Bernard Herrmann. You remember that, right? But, uh, we do not have songs. In this movie, we have songs. Please, Mr. Postman is another uh, scene. Do you remember when it is played? Ranjit, you have watched the movie re quite recently. Yeah, tell me why. Okay, so, there is a Rolling Stone soundtrack also, tell me why. When Harvey Keitel enters this very sleazy, shady bar, nightclub. Okay, and it is all bathed in reds and golds and whites, devil's colors. 
Okay. So, the, he comes from a very catholic background, okay. so where everything is bathed in uh, nice colors ni and also uh, lights, okay, very bright lights, but the moment he enters the bar, it is all bathed in blacks and reds. Okay. And then you have standard Scorsese signature shot, which shot is that? Harvey Keitel entering the nightclub. Yeah, and where is the camera focused? On the subject or on Harvey Keitel's face or something else? At the back of Harvey Keitel's head. So, what is what is Scorsese doing? He is taking us along Harvey Keitel. Okay, what is it? It is a long shot and a very strong and this you should know. Now, you are going to do a do presentations on key concepts, point of view shot. And what is point of view shot? We are looking at this world from Harvey Keitel's point of view, therefore back of his head. So, Scorsese wants us to see what our actor is seeing, this is important. In taxi driver, he takes it to another level tight close ups of Robert De Niro's eyes. Eyes that means again one way of showing his point of view and he what is his point of view? The world is disgusting, yeah. someday rains would come and wash the scum away, famous lines from taxi driver. Remember those Bernard Herman's very intriguing music playing in the background. Okay. And when you are giving a, a tight close up of the actor's eyes, what are you showing on the other hand? Apart from point of view, the inside of his mind. See, it is not a, a being John Malko, Malkovich came much later, okay, where you are actually taken inside somebody's head. Remember, please do watch being John Malkovich, Kaufman brothers made the movie. John Cusack and have actually we have John Malkovich and we are taken inside John Malkovich's head and there is an opening in his head and people would walk in and walk out. It is a very metaphysical, okay. you do not have to take it literally, we, you cannot jump inside his causes his head and come out, but when you show a tight close up of Bob De Niro's eyes, you are actually being transported inside his head, that is one way of showing that you are looking at this character psyche, psychology. So, that is a standard Scorsese shot and then later on he perfected it in the good fellas, where there is a long take and the camera just tracks this couple and while they are, while he, the man wants to show the woman how powerful and how important he is, he is a gangster, that is his life's ambition to be a gangster, that is all he wanted to be, remember? Okay, that is all in Goodfellas, our hero wants to be nothing but a gangster. He was fascinated by the glamorous lifestyles of these people, throwing about money, driving in Cadillacs and what not, so the, this is and guns. So, he said, this is the life, I mean who cares about my very lower middle class parents, their hard working ways, but you, you must be like them. So, when he makes it big, so he takes his girl through this passage it is at the back of the restaurant where the best table is laid out for them, although there are no tables free at that point, but he wants to show her, show off actually and the camera just tracks them, it is again a point of view shot and the girl is as uh, awestruck <laughs> as uh, this man, okay. so they fit, they, they complement each other because she is as fascinated by the lifestyle as him. Scorsese's favorite shot, point of view shot. He followed it again in his next movie, The Age of Innocence. There is a scene where Newell and Archer, as played by Daniel De Lewis, he walks inside a huge ballroom and its a camera again focuses at the back of his head. And by that time, it, the movie was released in 93, I had watched enough of Martin Scorsese and I felt, yeah, here it comes again because that is Martin Scorsese. So, we were talking about authorism and yeah. So, Authorism, directors deliberately try to develop a personal style. In mean streets, 
one of his very first movies, he tries to develop a deeply personal style by showing by, by showing the credits in a home video format. He did it again in Raging Bull. That is the only part in the movie which is shot in color. Okay. So, look at all these uh, things, you know there is always a pattern there. Okay. Anything else you would like to talk about? Yeah, you are to, uh, you pay for your sins. Yeah, in in streets and not in the church. Okay, no matter what anyone tells you. But then he is like his cause. See, he is a man torn between the mean streets and his deeply Catholic upbringing. So that's scorsese. That's the way he always remained. Okay, and films offered him uh, a haven to escape these two contradictions, where he can combine the best of two. So, see, his, all his movies are about uh, this uh, resolving a conflict, a dichotomy between religion and uh, crime. Okay, so that's about uh, <coughs> mean streets, and we'll do. Uh, Scorsese again in detail, we will take a particular movie from him uh, by him and then we will discuss it later. But then let us look at what was new Hollywood all about. So, we have been doing it for quite a while and uh, let me take back, uh, take you to December, something that happened on December 8, 1969, uh, where Rolling Stones were doing a show near somewhere near San Francisco and Mick Jagger famously sang, performed to Sympathy for the Devil. Now, this is quite telling, Sympathy for the Devil. Have you watched the? I watched the documentary, it is called Gimme Shelter. Exactly. Okay. And we have already talked about uh, the makers of Gimme Shelter, the Maisley, Maisley brothers. We were talking about, they were the people who developed this documentary uh, and handheld lightweight equipment, which were very conducive to making documentaries. And health angels were invited to augment the security quotient for the Rolling Stones. And they came on their Harley Davidsons and they would wear brass knuckles and carry their uh, usual accoutrements that knives and sticks etcetera, sometimes even guns. So, a riot broke out and a young black man was knifed, he was killed. So, that was the, okay. so all this was caught on film and as Ranjit was saying, the Maisley brothers made a documentary called Give Me Shelter, based on these events. So, what, what are we talking about now, sympathy for the devil and the, somebody is killed on the spot by hell's angels. So, what are we talking about that America was caught in some kind of a cultural revolution. Okay. So, therefore, this sudden interest in demonic possessions, okay, I am just giving you a, the background for some of the great movies which were made and some all movies based on novels. Okay. So, the godfather of course, it is not a, a supernatural thriller, but people taken over by a, something extremely demonic, demonic forces, right. Not exactly supernatural, do you understand me, what I am trying to say? The way Michael, Michael Corleone's character, the way his character graph is changed, he is slowly taken over, you know he is possessed by demonic forces, not necessarily supernatural, but this uh, hunger and obsession for power is also a kind of satanic force. So, um, in other words, America was ready for creepy tales of cream, demonic positions and um, William Peter Blatty wrote his novel, The Exorcist in 1971. Earlier, we had Ira Levin's Rosemary's Baby. Okay. So, Polanski had already made a movie based on people who are taken over by the demonic 
position uh, forces. But before we <coughs> go on to do the exorcist and other works by uh, Fritkin, I just wanted you to get introduced to Hal Ashby. Hal Ashby had already made a movie called Harold and Moon, which was very experimental and avant-garde. Do you remember? We were talking about Harold and Moon. Maud is 80, Harold is 20 and both of them are in love. Okay, so, that is that un, a very, very unconventional love story. So, Hal Ashby who started his career as an editor, he made a couple of great movies. The last detail which was an honorable flop starring Jack Nicholson, then Shampoo starring Warren Beatty, Goldie Hawn and Julie Christie. So, uh, Shampoo is also a reworking of a restoration comedy. Restoration period was an important period in uh, the British history and the theatre of that period was marked by drawing room comedies, the so called comedy of manners, lifestyle of the rich and famous as we see the today. Okay, so, drawing room comedies where ladies and gentlemen of that period would act out, you know, their loves and their intrigues, etcetera. So, Shampoo uh, is partly based on William Weisherle, who was a prominent writer, a playwright of the restoration period and his comedy, The Country Wife. Does anyone know what it is all about? What is The Country Wife all about? Why shall we start that the country wife? Uh, what is shampoo about? See, why shall is the country wife is all about a gentleman who pretends to be impotent. And why does he want to do that? So that other men do not feel threatened by him. So, a very bold theme, particularly for those periods, I mean we are looking at uh, restoration period, okay. so, yeah. so that is the period we are looking at and a theme like that. Shampoo is all about a hairdresser played by Warren Beatty. Now, generally what are hairdressers known for? Of course, they have, they are experts, but in their own craft, but there is also a, a cliche about hairdressers that they are yeah, most of them are gay. Warren Beatty's character plays on this cliche, this is stereotype and spreads a gossip about himself that he is gay. Okay. And then uh, all men, all the Beverly Hill types, you know what is Beverly Hills? Okay, a very posh, very rich area okay. and all men entrust their wives with him because they feel, okay, no, yes, what can he do after all? And then he has a string of affairs with everybody's wife. So, that is shampoo. Shampoo was scripted by Robert Town and it was a huge smashing success directed by Hal Ashby. He also directed Coming Home in 1978. Shampoo is considered a classic. Okay. Just ignore all these raunchy stuff about it and watch it as a serious piece. It is a comedy. Okay, but it does have very strong political subtext about the Nixon era. Okay. So, watch the movie. Warren Beatty after all, after all was a very political kind of, a, of an actor. Now, uh, we were just talking about sympathy for the devil and then William Fritkin, he arrived on the scene. Nine, he was born in 1935. He had made a couple of documentaries and art house films. So, he was stuck with that image. He is an art filmmaker. Most of the films were huge flops and uh, while he was making his television shows, he had also done work on uh, a program called the Alfred Hitchcock uh, Hour or uh, sometimes it is also called Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Okay. So, it was a TV show which began in 1965. Success came in the form of the French Connection. 
starring Jean Heckman. I think we did the French connection in one of our earlier courses. This was followed by The Exorcist. Then he made a movie called Sorcerer. Sorcerer is based on Henry Clouseau's movie Wages of Fear, a French movie. Remember, we are talking about uh, the new Hollywood directors who were heavily influenced by the Europeans. Yeah, so that that influence remained. The so, Sorcerer was a reworking of Wages of Fear by Clouseau. Later on, he made Rules of Engagement, which is a pretty recent movie, and then Killer Joe, as recent in 2011. But his reputation rests on the French connection and the exorcist. So, um, he was also influenced by film, uh, French films like Diabolique and Wages of Fear, we have just talked about by both by Clouseau and Citizen Kane changed the way he perceived films. He said, okay, this is like, you know, James Joyce's uh, Ulysses, it is as important a text as Joyce's Ulysses is to literature. He admired European cinema and some of his all time favorite films were Blow Up. We have often been talking about Blow Up by uh, yeah, Antonini, uh, A Hard Day's Night, The Beatles Picture, <coughs> Juliet of the Spirits and La Guerre et Fini. So, these were his film, these were his favorite films that went on to influence him deeply. He has been quoted as having said that the plotted film is on the way out. You know what is a plotted film? A movie with a strong plot. The other day we were talking about does Easy Rider have a strong plot and we agreed, no, it does not, it does not. So, that is what, so style is more important, substantial style should take over the plot, that was the idea. Plot was important in classic Hollywood period. So, uh, it is no longer of interest to a serious director, uh, a new th theatre audience, which is uh, who is under 30 and uh, they are largely interested in abstract experience, that is what he believed in. That audience is the age demography has changed and they are in interested more in abstract experiences rather than give them more concrete, more plotted stories. However, uh, at that period, at that point, he was also seeing the great Howard Hawks. So, you people know who Howard Hawks was, right? And he was seeing his daughter, Kitty Hawks, who was a model. And they met the great Howard Hawks and Howard Hawks said that, what kind of movies you people make? They do not make much sense to me. And in my time, there were the good guys and the bad guys and the good guys would always win. And uh, it brought us a lot of success. Okay, so, why do not you people go back to making that kind of cinema? And those words remained with William Fritkin. He said, yes, this is a, an advice which comes from one of the great authors. So, perhaps there is something to it. So, uh, <coughs> later on he said, after condemning the plotted films and all that, he said, American films of the 30s and 40s had clear storyline and strong characters. The new wave of European filmmakers took over and we all went out and copied Godard and Fellini, forgetting where our roots are. Okay. That means, going back to our roots. So, how many of you are familiar with the French connection? Only one or two? Please do watch it watch it as your necessary viewing. So, the French connection was a result of all these golden pieces of advice by Howard Hawks starring Jean Hackman and also Fernando Ray, who is the antagonist. Jean Hackman is the protagonist and this is a still from the French connection where after a famous car chase scene, uh, Gene Hackman shoots down the, uh, the person who is escaping. So, what is the French connection all about? Okay, this is one of the key texts of uh, 
in the new Hollywood period. So, it is a fact based thriller, it is based on real life events about a drug ring busted up by the NYPD. It is adapted from a novel by Robin Moore and contrary to what uh, Godas and Fellinis were doing all along, uh, Fritkin <laughs> is stuck to whatever Howard Hawks advised him to do and followed a linear narrative story. Earlier he had planned it in a non-linear, more experimental style, but then he met Howard Hawks fortunately, who advised him to follow the classic Hollywood style of making, but it is not classic Hollywood. If you watch it, it, it has its experimental moments, it is quite avant-garde, but uh, basically followed a traditional linear, more accessible kind of storyline. Uh, Bullet, a movie starring Steve McQueen, please watch it, okay, take it down, which was released a few years earlier. It has one of the most breathtaking car chase sequences, a very lengthy, very daredevilry, devilishly shot scene, Steve McQueen on a chase. And that, that movie, that scene was one of the contributing factors in making bullets such as smash hit. And the producers of the French Connection insisted that since you are making a cop drama, you know there is a sub genre of action adventure movies, the cop drama. So, the, uh, <coughs> Fritkin was advised by the producers to insert a scene. It is like today our filmmakers are advised to insert a good, an item number. If you have uh, Karina Kapoor or Katrina Kaif doing something, you know, an item you know, in the middle of a very serious film, a very gloomy film like Agnipath, okay, then the chances of success automatically increase. So, let us have a car chase sequence in the French connection and then let us see. So, the French, can, if you Google, if you look, uh, look it up and uh, just type in top 10 car chase sequences of all time. Bullet is number 1 followed by the French connection. Okay, so, it became very popular and of course, the French connection was his homage to uh, the French masters who uh, he admired so much. Fernando Rey, as we were just talking about actor, was the frog. The frog is the code give, name given uh, to the to these drug dealers, to these European drug dealers by the NYPD cops. Okay. Uh, does he mean anything to you? Have you watched him in any of uh, his uh, European films? He was a favorite of uh, Bunel. He appeared in many of his films. Fernando Rey. The car chase scene, which was actually shot on locations, it was not something that was shot uh, on the sets or a studio thing, but it was a real scene shot on real locations. And uh, William Fritkin was recently, uh, you know there is a documentary where William Fritkin takes you again to a walking tour of those, exactly those areas, those locations where this scene was shot. Okay, so, um, Fritkin had seen Z. Z is also R Shanghai, okay, R Shanghai, Dibakar Banerjee's uh, great movie Shanghai is also based on Z. It is basically a 1966 novel by Vasilikos and which was filmed by Costa Gravis in Greek in 1969. It is a movie about political decay, corruption, intrigues and uh, it is it's based on hard facts, but then it, uh, a film after all is not, not a documentary. So, in spite of being based on hard facts, you can always give it a fictional twist. So, that is what Costa Gravis did to Z and that is what Friedkin wanted to do. So, follow a documentary approach, but still give a strong storyline and some strong characters, give it that touch of fiction. At the same time, 
he used or captured a strong street reality, you know, very gritty street scenes captured through handheld camera. That was a sort of the rigor of that period. Gene Hackman plays a hard boiled cop, Popeye Doyle. Okay, Popeye Doyle, that's his nick. Again, there are no clear cut heroes or villains. The villain is a is an aesthet. He is extremely sophisticated. Popeye Doyle, Gene Hackman, is a very gritty, very real life uh, like cop, um, given to basic in, uh, baser instincts and all. Whereas the villain, the so called villain, is very polished, very sophisticated. Okay. Uh, there is no effort to sentiment, uh, sentimentalize or romanticize Hackman's character. Okay. He is just shown as a hard hitting cop and which is what he is. At the end, he also ends up killing his own partner, an, a, an FBI agent. Whereas, the villain escapes, they manage to get the drugs, they manage to bust the drug deal, but still the frog escapes, because he is he has that kind of you know evolved and more sophisticated intellect and he is able to outdo and outsmart all these NYPD cops. So, that is the difference, that is the class difference between them which shows. So, at the end he is able to escape and they cannot do anything about it. So, he, the villain does not get uh, arrested at the end of the movie. Give me some instances, focus on her. Yeah. The good, the cop villain difference and how they have been stuck to characterization, and even the idea of the master thief and the thief escaping at the end. You know, Dhoom is a very glamorous movie. Do we agree? Okay, both Dhooms, part one and part two, and of course now we are having the third part as well. So Dhoom happens to be a very stylized, very glamorized version of uh, this subgenre called the cop and criminal kind of cinema. And the fact that invariably a top star plays the role of the master thief, that also says, says a lot. Uh, Dhoom falls not under the category of a, a gritty, hardcore, hard hitting movie, but something called and that is something we will do quite, uh, later on this in, in this course called high concept cinema, high concept cinema. And what are the qualities of a high concept cinema? Not exactly free style. A stylized cinema. Dhoom, by the way, is inspired by the saint, okay, Val Kilmer saint, where the master thief is a master of disguises. Yeah, so, saint is also a comic book character, and later on uh, it was a TV series, yeah, and then almost like ocean series. Oceans also began. Where, it was during the 60s and the early 70s, it was a very successful TV series. Yeah. You do not know that? Yeah. Oceans was a TV series during uh, the earlier decades and then we had George Clooney and Brad Pitt and Matt Damon and all of them coming together and making, it is a very good example of high concept cinema. Now, I am giving you two instances, one from our own background, from our own scene, uh, Dhoom and one from the Hollywood scenario. Ocean series, Clooney, Brad Pitt, etc. Okay, and this is a good example of high concept cinema. So now, give me what what do you understand by high concept cinema? Louder, louder. Not necessarily robbery. Okay. Pre-planned, pre very thought thought of, and yeah. experts uh, doing, coming together as a team. And, and so, not necessarily about robbery or heist. It is not a highest movie, high concept cinema is where the look of the movie is planned before, high concept cinema is where the stars are signed before okay, and then the actual shooting begins. Uh, that you know we are going to spend unlimited amount of money on this particular movie, just get us all the stars together and the story will revolve around these stars. So, get Hrithik Roshan and Amir Khan or and John Abraham, story will come later. That is the way we, uh, uh, many producers in India make movies. Now, uh, abroad this concept of having sequels and franchises, 
do not you think that is also one way of high concept, another category of high concepts cinema, mission impossible, you need to have a mega star like Tom Cruise and then publicize, look Tom Cruise is going up Burj Khalifa, so that is it. So, there are uh, uh, set pieces, there are episodes which are breathtaking, okay, so that is high concept cinema, not necessarily heist or robbery movie, that is reservoir dogs and um, you know Bob Laflamber, which uh, Jean Melville did it, it was one of the earliest uh, heist movies, Oceans is the heist movies, but Oceans idea is to bring together all these stars together, shoot in exotic locations, okay, give them exotic leading ladies. Okay. So, everything you know, so you are starting with a blockbuster, you are planning a blockbuster, you are not looking at art, high concept is purely commerce. Cleopatra must have been a high concept movie for those days, okay. they were definitely not making it for artistic satisfaction. It was look, look Elizabeth Taylor is uh, this Egyptian queen and cover her in beautiful garments and beautiful jewellery and present her this way to the audience, that is high concept cinema. So, star is more important, star dumb is more important. So, therefore, when we think of high concept cinema, we think star dumb and crores and millions and billions of mo uh, money is spent on that. Okay, whereas, this kind of cinema is pretty different. So, whom to answer your question is high concept okay, rather than French connection kind of move. Pardon me? Avengers, is it a high concept movie? Pretty, you know, it is it's capitalizing on what? On a formula. Okay, so, high concept movies can always manipulate a particular formula. X Men, you, know, you bring together James McAvoy and uh, all these uh, uh, Michael Fassbinder, okay. Hugh Jockman is uh, in the earlier movie, but I am talking about the sequel, yeah, X Men First Class, that is much more glossy, much more lavishly mounted, do not you agree, okay, because they have made so much of money in the first series that they want to redo and make more money in the second part, so, that is the idea. Hugh Jockman makes a very fleeting appearance in the movie, a cameo in the movie. Okay, so, but it is an out and out high concept film. Most of these James Bond movies, they are high concept films, they are capitalizing on what? Stardom of course, and also uh, on the image of this super successful British spy, who is already a brand identity. So, play on that. So, Dhoom, Dhoom 1, Dhoom 2, Dhoom 3, it is a successful franchise, so let us capitalize on that. Now, they are making Krish 1 and Krish 2, okay, so it is an established brand, so let us capitalize on that. In Hollywood, there are any number of examples, okay, so definitely all these franchises are examples of high concept cinema. Okay. Now, uh, Exorcist based on Blatty's novel, a supernatural thriller, Sympathy for the Devil, think of all those things and uh, uh, I quote Fritkin again, he said, a good part of my motivation to do the exorcist, because I wanted to make a better film than Francis, who is this Francis? Coppola and what had Francis done? The Godfather, okay. So, <clears throat> if Francis can achieve super success, then why cannot I? So, he was like a test stone for that generation of filmmakers. I want to be more successful than Francis and the French connection had already made him in many ways more successful than Francis, because he won all the Oscars that year, all the Academy Awards. He was pitted against Peter Bogdanovich's is the last picture show, but then Fritkin ended up winning most of the, uh, Gene Hackman won it for the best actor. So, uh, the exorcist seemed unfilmable, there are certain novels which people declare this cannot be filmed, this cannot be made into a movie. Our Devdas is a very filmy novel, okay, you read the novel, I have read the, it is in fact a novella, you, know, you start to finish read, read it and you can see 
are great actors, you know, it is like high concept, uh, you feel like yeah, in one generation Dilip Kumar could have played it, in second generation Amitabh Bachchan could have done this role and now we have our Shah Rukh Khan and Abhay Deol reprising the roles, okay, so, so fitting our social context. So, it looks like a high concept novel written for made to order high concept cinema, the beautiful women vying for his affection and what not. So, everything is there, the raw material is there. The ex give me some more examples of unfilmable novels. Yeah, but it has it been a way? They have tried to, but it is largely a win. Yeah. Love in the Times of Cholera, it has been maybe Javier Bardem. Yeah. So, uh, that is not an unfilmable novel. But there is a, an unfilmable novel called uh, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, which was basically, uh, everyone thought you cannot make it into a movie, but later on it was made into a movie with Daniel Day Lewis, a very young one. Okay. But there are certain novels which look as if they are made to order. For example, Gone with the Wind, the author Margaret Mitchell, she says, she has gone on record saying that while writing the novel, she had Clark Gable in her mind for Red Butler. Okay. So, The Exorcist was considered unfilmable because of these possession scenes and poltergeists and levitations. I mean, how do you show that on screen? Especially for those times when technology was not all that developed. It was also surrounded by controversies. Can anyone tell me what are those controversies? No, I think there is portrait. No, no, no I do not think anyone died while filming uh, The Exorcist. But it has some and this is more serious than people dying, uh, because in our world fortunately or unfortunately religion is more important than people's lives. So, it has some strong antichrist images and if you look it up, I, you, you will understand what I am talking about. Okay. And uh, um, it is it's not a very progressive cinema, let me tell you. We talk about new Hollywood cinema, we talk about a hard days, night, anti-authoritarian, we talk about Bonnie and Clyde and Easy Rider. Exorcist was not that kind of, it takes you back to the old established patriarchal way of life, where uh, the absence of father, in other words, leads to all these problems. The little girl played by Linda Blair, she is possessed, because you see, uh, she is growing up in a household where there is no father, mother is a single woman, right. Okay, so, what was happening? The reception was that people were just lining outside the theatres. People were dying to watch this movie, what is this all about? The hype was phenomenal and while watching the movie, people were fainting, collapsing and breaking into hysteria and the Catholic Church was besieged with requests about uh, exercising the demons inside. Everyone believed that they are possessed now, having watched the movie. We will continue with this tomorrow. Thank you very much.